KETV News Watch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. A lot of time uh, talking to our federal delegation and to their staffs every week regarding issues that are important to us. Most of those, again, are done uh, in every ordinary day conversations or via email or letters, not standing up and having a press conference. That's probably not exactly the way that most governors want their lieutenant governor to operate. It is a philosophy Governor Dave Heinemann stuck with once he became the state's chief executive, quietly but effectively getting things done. We've been talking to Dave Heinemann for well over a decade now. That, which you saw earlier, was from a 2002 interview back when he was running as Mike Johan's second in command. Now, his run as governor is nearing an end, and he is facing a new challenge what to do after leaving office. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Brandy Peterson. This is a special edition of KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Yeah, we're going to spend the next hour talking with Governor Dave Heineman, a man who, unless the laws are changed, will go down in Nebraska history as the longest serving governor. Well, first, a little background. Governor Heineman is a native Nebraskan, born in Fall City, growing up in Fairbury, McCook. Bankelman in Wahoo. That's where he graduated from high school. He then went to West Point and served five years in the U.S. Army, rising to the rank of captain. Now, Heineman's life in politics started on the Fremont City Council, served nearly seven years as state treasurer, three years as lieutenant governor, ten years as governor. With a look back at his time in office, here's KETV News Watch 7's Andrew Ozaki. I so swear. It was his dream job. Taking over from Mike Johans, who left to become U.S. Secretary of Agriculture in January of 2005. Winning election, then re election in landslide fashion. Steering the state over the past decade to historic job growth, the two largest tax cuts, and a record cash reserve, even as the national economy went through one of the worst downturns since the Great Depression. We believed in a fundamental financial principle. We don't spend money we don't have. Now, one of the biggest challenges driving Dave Heineman. Relearning how to drive. It's been 10 years without driving because, uh, you know, the troopers take you everywhere. Now, I've gone out and practiced a little bit in the last month or so, but I've got a lot more work to do. Uh, I, I think my family is nervous. They don't want to be out when I'm out. In an interview with KETV News Watch 7, the governor and first lady Sally Gannon talked candidly forward. about their legacy. And I'm proud of the fact that I can say economically and educationally, we're stronger today than we were a decade ago. Heinemann pushed for and got statewide assessments in reading, writing, math, and science. And in the last decade, was one of the few states that shielded education from budget cuts. We were one of the 13 that actually increased real money to education. Of course, I always say it's never enough. The governor says he knew better than to cut schools, with Gannam being a former principal and teacher. I probably would have got a cold shoulder in addition to the cold stare, but, uh, you, know, hey, you know, we talk all the time. She knew the challenges that we faced. On agriculture, trade missions under Heinemann secured $2.4 billion worth in contracts for Nebraska producers. On one trip, Heinemann even endured a four hour, one sided conversation with Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. While standing, we weren't about to sit down because he wasn't. And he finally uh, finished talking at 12:45 at night. And I thought I should give him a four-hour lecture about the state of Nebraska. But we were scheduled to be on a plane the next morning at seven o'clock. Over the years, the governor has had his critics, problems exposed in the Department of Health and Human Services, and recently the Department of Corrections. A report from a special legislative committee blamed Heineman's leadership for sentencing miscalculations in possibly illegal programs that release hundreds of inmates early. The leadership or the, the absence of leadership and the culture that developed at the Department of Corrections compromised public safety. We provided the leadership that said, okay, I accept the responsibility, the buck stops at my desk, and now how do we correct it? In a statement this week, the governor said, quote, Senator Lathrop has only been interested in trying to score political points. We've made most of the corrections. There's still going to be work to do for the new uh, legislature. The worst days on the job, seeing two of his lieutenant governors forced to resign amid scandal. I wish you well. It really impacted the governor just emotionally, and I saw him just drained. And after 10 years, there are some things about Heineman only a few know. Like he was a stay at home dad for his son Sam. He even turned down a chance to run for governor 20 years earlier. Sam was just going into middle school, would have been middle school age. Sam went to his dad, put his arms around him, and said, Daddy, if it means you have to be gone, please don't do this. 
at that time we just didn't think the timing uh, was right and as it turned out I got another opportunity and I'm thankful for that. Another thing we don't know is what the governor will do after January 7th, his last day in office, because neither does he. I know that, you know, maybe for a week or so we can take it easy, and then by then uh, we're going to have to figure out, okay, what are we going to do now? On the other hand, we'll be able to be more spontaneous, and when friends invite us over, we'll be able to say, well, yes, we, we can just drop over. They say they will miss the interaction with Nebraskans, volunteering at nearby McPhee Elementary School. Well, thank you very thank you much. So much. Showing off the mansion to visitors. This is a happy place. It's a warm place. It's very inviting. The First Lady will continue her work on her final assignment, creating a virtual tour of the mansion. She's already raised $400,000 for the project. So that teachers can just download them and use them in teaching Nebraska history. Heinemann will probably leave office with one of the highest approval rates ever, but there is one family member who is even more popular. The biggest challenge is going to be for our dog Snickers. He's never known another house except for here. For Chronicle, Andrew Osaki, <laughs> KETV, Newswatch 7. You good work, man. You good work. Well, joining us now is outgoing Governor Dave Heinemann. Governor, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's great to be with you. Looking at all of that, starting with the first clip in that story when you were sworn in 10 years, has it gone by quick or is it? Brandy, it's flown by. I can remember the first day uh, that I was in office. Uh, it was very, very exciting, challenging, uh, fun, and it's been that way ever since. I mean, we've got to make a lot of difficult decisions, but I've thoroughly enjoyed being governor. The people of Nebraska are just terrific, and uh, uh, what I've appreciated, they've always been willing to share their opinions with me, their ideas how to make government better, how to grow the economy, how to strengthen our education system. Any regrets? No, not really. I mean, I've always focused on the future, Rob. What can we do tomorrow? What can we do a month from now, six months from now to make the state better? And that's just me. Uh, you can't change yesterday, but you can impact the future and try to learn from what you've done and make it better. And uh, I'm proud of where we're at today. We're stronger economically and educationally than we've ever been, and that was our focus. Do you think it's all of those things, your personality, your roots in Nebraska, why are you leaving with such a high approval rating? Uh, you know, I, I probably can't answer that as well as others. I, I can just say growing up in Nebraska, you understand the state better. I grew up in a small town, Nebraska, a lot of small communities. My dad worked for J.C. Penney's all his life, and they moved him around every couple of years. That's why we moved. And... Um, you know, I just, you know, learned from my mom and dad to be approachable, to listen to people. And I've really enjoyed traveling the state because that's the only way you really know what's going on. And whether we're at an event to honor a teacher or a business leader or a community volunteer or we're at a Husker football game, basketball game, volleyball game, people just come up to me and they share their ideas with me and they say, hey, Governor, you ought to be aware of this. And then we check into it. So... I, I'm pleased that they respect what we've done. I've enjoyed working with them. Well, you're certainly not going to go out quietly. There is uh, there are a number of issues we want to get right. into them. Uh, first and foremost, prison reform. Uh, special legislative committee came out in mid-December, harshly critical of your leadership. Former Department of Corrections Director Bob Houston defended you. Senator Ernie Chambers blamed you. Let's listen to what both of them had to say. It was actually created by the parole board. And it wasn't to circumvent the parole system. We worked hand in hand with the parole board. There wasn't a single person put on the reentry furlough program that the parole board didn't sign off on. The things that happened in the Department of Corrections are right at the doorstep of the governor. So let me ask you, Governor, do you what's your reaction to them? Do you agree with them? Uh, no, I don't. They're trying. The Lathrop report tries to rewrite history. Uh, for example, they talk about uh, there's a 2006 uh, report that suggested we build a new prison. Senator Lathrop's been there for eight years now and never once introduced a bill to build a new prison or to fund a new prison. So su to suggest that after the fact, I believe, is disingenuous and hypocritical. Now, I've tried to focus on the positive. We've been working with Senator Ashford, for example, the last eight years to reform the criminal justice system. We passed a number of bills, and our whole objective was to do a better job and avoid spending $250 million on a new prison. And we've been successful, and with the Council of State Governments uh, group that we're now working with, the Chief Justice, 
uh, the Speaker of the Legislature and I uh, co-chair that. I believe you'll see additional reforms in the next legislative session. And again, we won't have to build a new $250 million uh, uh, prison system. Yeah, but Senator Lathrop put out a, a statement saying that your comments are desperate spin, a deceitful attempt to avoid responsibility. Well, he's just wrong. Uh, you know, his priority seems to be uh, criminals in the prison system. I'd rather spend that $250 million on kids in the classroom. Let's educate our children, get them early, make sure they understand their responsibility, give them a great education, that'll give them a great opportunity. So I, I strongly disagree with what he's had to say. The dismissal of some of the people in charge of corrections was one of the recommendations. I know Governor-elect Ricketts, when we talked to him on Chronicle, said new leadership, but change in culture was necessary. Were those things that you ever considered? Uh, well, first of all, we, we, we did make a change. We had a separate independent personnel report and for example the legal counsel down at the department of corrections george green george green he was the guy who made most of the mistakes he no longer works for state government he he essentially had a choice get fired or retire and he chose to uh retire now uh we brought in a new director uh mike kenny came in under very difficult circumstances he's tried to move the uh, department forward i understand where governor elect uh, ricketts is headed i support that uh, and we do need a culture change down there, given what occurred. But again, I want to emphasize there are a lot of good people in the Department of Corrections who've done their job properly, and we shouldn't allow four, five, six people uh, to taint the entire department. One more question on this, uh, and it's it's a little bit of hindsight, but should you have not declared an emergency on the prison overcrowding situation? That seems to be one of the key points. Is you should have, as governor, said. This is an emergency situation. We're at 140% of capacity, or 160% now. You know, we should have done something. We should have set the we things in motion. Okay. When it hits 140%, you review the situation. Right. We didn't declare an emergency. Senator Ashford and I both talked to the director at time, Bob House. He says, I can manage it. And so we've continued to do that. And I believe even today we can still manage that. Now, you start to get to 170% or something like that, you're going to have a challenge. But you know what the Council of State Governments report? We found out, for example, uh, that it used to be judges, if they had, uh, someone had six months or less to serve, they put them in a county jail. Now we're starting putting them in the state prisons. So at a time when the crime rate is down, our prison population is up. We need to reverse that. Uh, we also have a situation where Omaha judges, for example, for the same uh, crime, they're sentencing people to prison where other judges are sentencing them to parole uh, or, uh, or probation, which is, I think, what we ought to do. The other thing you're going to see in the new report, more supervised release, which we support, more treatment programs. So again, I think we're on a path that we can continue to change, make the system better, and we won't have to build a new prison system. Kind of switching gears, HHS has also come under fire. Auditor Foley has come up with a number of reports showing mismanagement of funds. Was there ever a point where you said, this is on my watch, we've had too many of these, we need to go in and clean this up? Uh, we've been trying to do that all along. Uh, when you're the governor, you accept responsibility. This is a big organization, and when you're in charge of it, mistakes are going to be made. The key is then correct those mistakes. There have been a lot over in HHS, but there also is a challenge in HHS, Brandy, that the federal government silos too many of these programs. They don't give us the flexibility that we need. And so whether you're talking about Medicaid or you're talking about child welfare programs, what we need to do in Nebraska is different than California or New York. Uh, again, we need more flexibility, less regulation. I'd love to see uh, the federal government block grant those programs to the state, let us develop our own program, but certainly there are still improvements that need to be made at Health and Human Services. Yeah, we talked about it before. You said, I'm very unhappy where we're, where we're at. This is a quote relative to accountability and responsibility in HHS. Uh, you made sure people are no, who made those earlier mistakes no longer with the department need to hold people accountable. We've got to do a better job. I intend to make sure that happens. Some see that leading right up to you and right up to your doorstep again. You know, I mean, what do you say to that? I, 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 well, what I say is the, the governor has the ultimate responsibility. The buck stops at my desk. Mistakes are going to be made. Then you go about correcting them. That's what we've been doing. 
uh, both with what happened at the Corrections and Health and Human Services. And again, still more progress needs to be made. But we do need to take greater advantage of technology to provide a greater convenience and greater access to our services through the use of that technology. Now, some people don't want to get into the 21st century. Uh, they want you to still go to a brick and mortar building forever. That's not where the public's at today. They want to be able to do it at 2 o'clock at night on Saturday morning when that's when they're free, not necessarily 8 to 5 when they're working. Issue that just came up this week: uh, Attorney General Bruning filing a lawsuit saying that Colorado's legalization of marijuana is unconstitutional. It's hurting Nebraska. What are your thoughts? You know, I support what he's doing. Uh, I'll leave the constitutional arguments to him. But I know this: I've been to Western Nebraska. They have a great impact on our law enforcement capabilities out there. Uh, marijuana. Uh, I don't support the legal use of that. It's going to create all sorts of social problems. Uh, Colorado is already experiencing, for example. What happens when you're driving and you're high on marijuana? What do you get charged with? Their, their laws are not ready to deal with that. And again, it's impacting law enforcement with all this marijuana traffic going across our state, and particularly the panhandle of the state. Don't they just charge them on driving under impaired, driving while impaired? Uh, apparently, they don't have the same laws for uh, marijuana usage that you have drinking and driving, so they're still dealing with it, and it's creating all sorts of challenges for them. And again, this is one where they've made a decision that is impacting all of the surrounding states. Where do you draw the line between what is a state's decision um, and what is a federal decision? Well, and, and this is one that kind of is in that gray area, okay? I support states' rights. Uh, we ought to be able to do in our state uh, what makes sense for us compared to California, New York, Massachusetts. But you do have to be concerned about the states surrounding you. And this is one where maybe Colorado should have talked to us more, the other surrounding states, and the impact it's having on our law enforcement communities. Okay, we're looking at some of the issues or some of the things that have happened in, on, on your, when you've been governor. You and your wife both mentioned having two lieutenant governors resign was tough on you. When did you first find out what was going on with Rick Sheehy? Uh, when we were alerted to certain things uh, uh, by the Omaha World Herald, I had asked Rick several times, is there any truth to it? And, and he told me there wasn't, and, and I believed him. And then when it came up, I think a third time, I said, hey, wait, what's going on? And I could tell that time he wasn't telling me the truth. And uh, I said, uh, you, you don't have any choice. By tomorrow morning, you're going to have to resign. Okay, so then you moved to LeVon Heideman, and he had to resign shortly uh, during the election. Uh, how'd that conversation go? Well, uh, that was another difficult conversation because both of these were personal uh, behavior. They both did a great job as lieutenant governor. Well, he had a family squabble, a lawsuit between uh, custody battles, I recall, between he and his sister, and he knew exactly what he had to do once that became public. And it was very, very unfortunate because, again, LeVon uh, did a great job uh, as chairman of the Appropriations Committee during the time that he served as lieutenant governor. Why did it weigh on you so heavily? Are they your friends as well as colleagues? Uh, they were friends. They had done a good job. Uh, in the case of Rick, I expected him to tell me the truth. He didn't really in this particular case. And then LeVon was just going through a very difficult family situation involving his mother and, and the usage of certain medications and the family farm. And, and, and again, it was, just, it was more personal than anything else that these were two individuals that I trusted. They did a great job for me, but they got in trouble in, in terms of personal actions. You know, we have talked many times uh, about tax relief and your, your efforts against or with the legislature, I should say. Uh, legislature overrode pretty much all your vetoes this year, restoring 61 million of the 65 million that you cut. Relationship between your office and the legislature this past session doesn't really seem, didn't seem warm and fuzzy. Uh, we'll put it that way. How do you, how do you, what do you attribute that to? Uh, I attribute that to about three elections where three more liberal senators got elected instead of conservatives. And it got reversed in this previous uh, or in the latest election cycle. And you're going to see that relative to uh, Governor elect -like Rickinson, what he'll be able to do. So it was just more personal in nature. I mean, they support more government spending. I think we ought to uh, lower taxes, invest in education and job creation. Uh, they support uh, the automatic good time. I think it ought to be repealed. I think you're going to see those issues uh, get determined in a different manner in the next session because you're going to have different senators there. So uh, again, I enjoy working with them. There was just a difference of philosophy. How hard is it going to be for you when you're not governor anymore? You are a voter like all of us in the state of Nebraska and you see the legislature, governor-elect, 
doing these things, how hard will it be for you? It'll probably be hard, but uh, Brandy, you know, I'll be a former governor. I'm going to keep quiet. Uh, I want the new governor and the new legislature to have the opportunity to work themselves and move the state forward, and I'm confident they're going to do it. I've had my chance. It's been a great opportunity. We've had a great run. I'm proud of our 10 years, but it's time for the new governor and the new legislature. So I'll sit in the background. Maybe I'll send you a tweet or whatever, say, look into this or whatever. <laughs> do you tweet a lot? Uh, no, I don't as governor. And let me tell you why. Because of the public records uh, law and we have to keep track of all this, it's just easier uh, to call someone up and talk to them about an issue. And, but when I'm no longer governor, I'll be able to do that and I'll have some fun. Interesting. All right. Well, it's time for us to, to take a short break, but we are just getting started. And when we come back, we're going to touch on some trying times for the state. The Pilger tornadoes flooding in 2011. Lots of issues still to come. We're just two Nebraskans joining thousands of others who wanted to be here to say, we're behind you. Well, that was Governor Heineman back in December of 2007 when Von Mar reopened its doors. All day, customers flooded in looking for normalcy, for support, and of course, it was that time of year for Christmas gifts. Well, just a few weeks earlier, the mood was decidedly different. It was one of the deadliest in Nebraska history. Eight people died, five others were injured. Dave Heineman said, like most Nebraskans, when he heard about the shootings, he was in shock and asked everyone to pray for the victims and their families. And arguably, that's one of the toughest parts about being governor. Yeah, when tragic events happen, residents look to you for answers and for encouragement. Case in point, the twin tornadoes that leveled Pilger just this June. Our cameras were there when the governor has saw the mess firsthand. The damage so extensive, he immediately declared a state of emergency. And Heinemann also talked about all the volunteers who showed up to help. Americans, uh, Americans are showing up in support of this tiny uh, community. You know, their motto is, we're a little town too tough to die, and we're going to make sure they don't. So, when Nebraskans are in crisis, leading the state can be challenging. But during his 10 years in office, Governor Heineman has weathered many a storm. He's here with us today talking about the past decade. When you look at some of those things, was there a worse situation? Do they all kind of come together for you? Randy, the, the Von Moore situation was very, very difficult because we lost uh, many lives that day. And I'll never forget it because President Bush had been there earlier in the day. I was with him. I was on my way back to Lincoln. We were just about in Lincoln when we heard what, it, what occurred. And we were immediately in contact with the mayor and local authorities up here. Uh, the Pilger was a unique situation. Two tornadoes. Uh, we were out at the emergency operations center monitoring what was going on. We have different capabilities today. We actually got a live feed from a state patrol helicopter. Within 30 minutes, we could see everything that happened. Uh, I knew we needed to declare an emergency. Uh, we ordered the National Guard out to provide security. And then the thing I was most proud of, for the next two weeks, 1,500 Nebraskans showed up to volunteer. Five times as many people who live in Pilger were there every day. I've seen this with flooded floods. I've seen it with wildfires. It's amazing the volunteer spirit in this state and what we're willing to do to help each other out. Well, what's it like to get that phone call? I mean, does someone say, uh, Governor, I have some bad news? Or what, is it a red phone or is it your cell phone? Walk us through what, what's it like? Well, it's not a red phone, okay? I just want you to know that. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, it, it's a cell phone, and they're calling me to tell me what's going on. I know the, all the individuals very well, the adjutant general, the deputy manager of the Nebraska Emergency Management Agency, my chief of staff. Uh, we've d uh, dealt with each other for the last 10 years. We understand exactly what our responsibility is. And my first concern is for the people and the property. And almost invariably, we're going to be there within 24 hours uh, to show that we care. That's what Nebraskans want to know, that, uh, hey, the governor's aware of what's going on. Uh, can we offer services? We'll coordinate with our federal delegation. They've been absolutely fantastic when we needed assistance from FEMA. Uh, and we actually have a very good relationship with FEMA over the years. They actually operate in our office. And so it's something we understand, we're comfortable with. We never like it to happen. Uh, no matter what time of the day I get that call. Back to Von Maher, you mentioned you had just left Omaha. The president was here. I remember from our perspective, so many questions. Was this related to the president's visit? What had gone on inside? As governor, what are some of the questions you were asking? What, what were you going through? Uh, uh, same thing you were talking about, Brandy. Uh, what was causing this? And, and again, I was just thinking, 
uh, we had just uh, left the president who was on his way back to the nation's capital. One of the fortunate things that day, because he'd been in town, we had so many law enforcement already available that they immediately went to the scene. And then we just tried to stay in contact with local authorities, the mayor's office, local law enforcement. We try not to uh, intervene. When they need our help, we'll be there. We're, we're there to support, uh, but you're kept fully abreast of what's going on. Was there ever a moment you thought, this is my state? How is this happening here? Well, you always wonder about that, and it's something you just can't believe. Why would anyone do that? Uh, I, I don't understand why uh, someone would drive by a fast food res uh, uh, restaurant and just indiscriminately start shooting and innocently kill a young kid. Uh, that's something we never did when we were growing up. Certainly we did things we probably shouldn't have, but you never shot at other individuals and it's a different culture today than we've ever seen but I'm proud we're a much safer state than almost any other state in America thanks to all of us as parents and what we uh, teach our kids and the law enforcement community and the great job that they do. You mentioned the safety of Nebraska and that always raises a question because some people say well in some part pockets of the state it's not so safe for you know certain segments of the population what would you do you know if you if you were had another term or two terms, what would you do to make the streets even safer? Uh, we would continue to work, uh, for example, up here in Omaha with Mayor Stothard, uh, Chief Schmatter. They've got some great ideas, for example, repeal that automatically uh, good time law so that criminals don't get automatic good time when they're in the prison system. Uh, Chief Smotter's got a great idea about the greater use of electronic uh, devices, the ankle bracelets and all that, so we can keep track of individuals who may have committed a crime previously and may be prone to do it again. Uh, we've talked to them several times. We're there with the state patrol to help you in any way that you want, bring in additional law enforcement, conduct uh, random uh, searches or whatever that are legal to send a message, hey, we're here to protect the community. So it's an everyday responsibility. And again, I want to defend the men and women uh, who work in local uh, law enforcement. They do a great job. Same thing with our firefighters. They're called to help in, in many uh, different kinds of uh, situations. They do an incredible job too. Floods of 2011, a lot of political questions as well as natural disaster questions. Frustration from your office, all the calls you were getting about how things were handled from the um, the uh, people who were in charge of the dams being released or whatever yeah, the, the situation core. may be? Remember, Brandy, uh, I hosted two meetings of mm -hmm. uh, all the governors uh, along the Missouri River. It was one of the few times we've all been united. We were not very happy with the Corps of Engineers and the way they uh, released the water. We probably still would have had flooding, but it could have been managed better. Uh, they made a commitment after those two meetings that uh, they wouldn't do that again. And remember, we had both of those meetings out at Gallup, and you could look out the w window as we were hosting the meetings. The floodwaters were, were up. Uh, but I will say our citizens and the citizens of other states uh, responded in, in an extraordinary fashion. And, and again, uh, all of Omaha came together with Council Bluffs. Uh, we worked very closely with uh, Iowa in that regard. And we had the wildfires as well. A lot of people may, you know, because they didn't affect us right here, they may not re remember them as well. Uh, you went up there and you toured the area. When, at what point do you call in the National Guard to help? And what part do you call, what point do you call in the resources? Well, a couple things on that one. Uh, first of all, it was in the northwest corner of our state, one of the smallest communities uh, in our state, Harrison. And so I was up there, and we got these federal firefighters in, and volunteer firefighters. And I could tell the looks on those federal firefighters. Uh, you know, we're probably going to have to be in command here and take charge. We go in to do a briefing. The, the uh, chief of uh, the volunteer uh, firefighters that day from Harrison looked pretty scrubby and everything. And you're, oh my gosh, does he know what he's going doing? He gets up there and lays out a plan. And those firefighters, federal firefighters, the professionals looked at me and said. We'll just do whatever he says. He knows exactly what he's talking about. Uh, we had communicated early with them. We've got great local emergency managers in the state. We knew right away that they were going to need our helicopters for aerial support uh, to assist in trying to put out the, the fire. So, again, it helps when you have people who've been through this before. It's why we practice and train. You know, people wonder sometimes, why do you do all that? Well, in times like that, it really comes in handy. We knew exactly what to do. Uh, we'll 
will declare an emergency as quickly as we can because that gives me greater latitude to bring out the National Guard and other uh, resources. We have emergency agreements with local states. They all help us. We help them in time of need. For example, we sent our helicopters down to Oklahoma and other states uh, in time of need. They helped us when we were having those fires. But again, I was very proud of the men and women. And, and you just can't believe you, you go into those uh, local fire halls. And, and I kidded about this, but it was true. There was more water, food, and Gatorade there than in Memorial Stadium on any given Saturday <laughs> afternoon. And I would walk in, and one of the people who were serving would come up to me right away. I remember one time said, Governor, I've got these hot brownies. You need to have one. Now, I was an experienced governor. I said, oh, well, yes, I will. They're the best I've ever had. But I'm thinking, well, those ought to go to the firefighters. And what our communities do to support those firefighters? Because they would work 18 to 20 hours initially without a break. Right. Well, we still have a lot more to talk about here. Another 30 minutes to come on this special KETV Newswatch 7 Chronicle. Yeah, up next, we're naming names. That's right. I'm talking to the governor about uh, some of the state's top politicians. We'll be right back. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the public service of Dave Heineman, Nebraska's longest serving governor. More important than his time in office is what he has accomplished. He has kept our state prosperous by supporting agriculture, opening new trade opportunities, reforming economic development incentives, and improving education through greater local control. He has also been an ally of taxpayers by keeping our budget balanced and also advocating for tax reform. Under his watch, Nebraska consistently ranks among the best states to live, work, do business, and raise a family. I am thankful and grateful for Governor Heineman's leadership and service. I join all Nebraskans in wishing him and his wife, Sally Gannam, Godspeed as they embark on the next chapter in their lives. That was Nebraska Congressman Adrian Smith. Now take this number. Hard to believe, but in the past 10 years, the governor has signed around 2,050 bills into law. Yeah, and he is here talking with us about his time in office. All right, talking about naming names, you've worked with a lot of lawmakers. Favorites? Uh, you know, I'd share a couple with you, okay? Uh, I really enjoyed uh, working with Speaker Mike Flood. He did a tremendous job as Speaker. State Senator, then Deb Fisher. Uh, we worked on uh, uh, creating an innovative uh, system relative to roads funding. Uh, LaVon Heidemann was Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. I enjoyed uh, working with him. Senator McCoy here in the Omaha area has been a great ally. And then uh, a couple others. Senator Dave Landis, Democrat, I might add, right. from Lincoln. Uh, he helped us modernize our economic incentive programs the first two years I was there. Senator Ramey Jansen, another Democrat from Nickerson, helped us write the largest tax relief package in the history of the state. And then Senator Pat uh, Bourne, Omaha Democrat, conservative, uh, we worked with him on anti-methamphetamine legislation. So it's been senators of both parties from all across the state. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed working with them. We don't have to agree on every issue, but we respect each other. And we can disagree in this state in an agreeable way. What about Senator Chambers? He was there for so long, left, came back. Obviously, words have been exchanged. Your thoughts? You know, I, I was one of the very first ones, maybe the only one, who said when he came back, uh, you know, I was glad to see him back because I knew he'd keep them on their toes. But I also reminded him when I saw him one day, I said, Senator Chambers, you remember what you told me the day you left? He says, no, but I think you're going to remind me. Yes, you told me you were never coming back. But he missed it, and he did come back. Do you, uh, you have a somewhat contentious relationship with him. I mean, it's, it's been somewhat mm -hmm. civil, I imagine, over the years. Uh, is that how it has to be, or is, or is there a better way to, to, to make the, the sausage, <laughs> so to you speak? Know, I, I hope with Senator Chambers, I have great respect for him. I hope he respects me. We're going to agree on about two issues out of ten. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of times on education where we've been in agreement. Uh, we've worked with him. There are a lot of times when uh, uh, he wants to stop a bill, we're in agreement with him. And then other times he's going to have a different view of the criminal justice system or whatever. I mean, he supports automatic good time. He actually probably wrote that bill back in the early 90s. But, uh, again, I've enjoyed working with him. I have great respect for him. Uh, uh, he's a unique state senator. What about Coach Osborne? You ran against each other, know you're a huge football fan. Do you have a relationship together? Uh, we do. Uh, there is no individual I respect more in this state than Coach Tom Osborne. 
I mean, uh, what he's done for this state well beyond the football field uh, for helping kids or whatever is absolutely extraordinary. And I'll bet you, uh, you'll never see another race where we were running against each other. We never said a bad word about each other. We showed great respect for each other. We both told about what we wanted to do for the state. Uh, you know, I started out 40 points behind. No one thought I could win. I'm not even sure my mom thought I could win. And we worked really hard, and, and I think it turned out really well. Uh, we got Coach Osborne back as the athletic director. It was at a critical time relative to the University of Nebraska. But we both wanted to win, and, and, and I understand that. We were good competitors, but we had great respect for each other. He's an extraordinary individual. You know, uh, you talk Coach Tom Osborne, obviously brings up the athletic department yep. and something that's been in the news lately, uh, Bo Pelini's uh, parting shots, if you will. That speaks directly to the state's image. What is your response to what uh, Pelini said? Gee, I don't even know what you're talking about. Bo Pelini said something? Well, I cannot, re <laughs> I cannot repeat it here. Let me say that. You know, um, I I'm disappointed with the language he used. Mm -hmm. That was very, very unfortunate. Uh, it was a difficult situation for seven seasons. He won nine football games, but the university decided to go in a different way. There's a better way to handle that. Uh, it's unfortunate because everybody in Nebraska, we have a passion about football. Uh, we have 1.8 million assistant coaches, and we're really good about calling those plays after the fact, but it's in the fabric of this state. And, and, you, and we can thank Coach Devaney and Coach Osborne for that. Uh, we're united around our team. We don't have Iowa, Iowa State, Kansas, Kansas State. So everybody grows up being a Husker fan. Every community has one person who was part of the walk-on program. If you go to Duncan, Nebraska, and the sign says, Home of Corey Schlesinger, <laughs> and those two touchdowns to win the 1994 uh, Orange Bowl and the National Championship, those are the kinds of things that Nebraskans cherish. So this is an unfortunate situation. You can see why people would be frustrated when they hear these kinds of things. Because I remember Schlesinger rolling into the end zone yeah. for the, the championship. Who doesn't remember that video? Well, we are gonna, we're going to take a short break now. That's right. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about issues like Cuba, for example, trade missions that have really become very positive for Nebraska over the past decade. We'll be right back. I want to make sure our companies have the opportunity uh, to export to China. Uh, hopefully, there will over time be a number of Chinese companies that will invest in Nebraska. We're already beginning to see that. During his time as governor, Dave Heineman made a serious commitment to enhancing Nebraska exports. Yeah, he and several others led more than a dozen trade missions to China, to Cuba, and to numerous other countries. Governor Heineman with us today, and so tell us how crucial are those trade missions? They're important to the future economic success of Nebraska. Uh, the one thing I've learned over the 10 years, you know, it used to be, I'll say 15, 20 years ago, we competed in a Midwest economy. Today we compete in a knowledge-based, technology-driven, global free market economy. So we need to compete all over the world. We've established the first uh, ever trade offices for Nebraska in Tokyo and in Shanghai, China. Uh, I've been down to Cuba. That was a unique experience. Uh, when I went down there, I could tell you some great stories. Is this your legacy? Do you want this to be your legacy? Well, I don't always get tied up in my legacy, but this is part of the economic success we had. Uh, you have to go market your state. I don't mind being the chief cheerleader, the chief salesman, because uh, I've got a great state to sell and market. Uh, the world's uh, population is going to grow about 2 billion over the next 30 years. 90% of that's going to be over in Africa and Asia, so they're going to need more Nebraska food products, our beef, our pork wheat, soybeans, corn, general business products. So the next governor and all future governors are going to have to compete in a global marketplace. We also did two reverse trade missions where we brought about 500 government and business leaders here to Nebraska. We worked with the business community in the Omaha Lincoln area, the ag community, the University of Nebraska to showcase what we had to offer and, and, and that was a wonderful experience. You met Castro. Uh, do you support uh, where we're going, uh, opening up diplomatic ties with them again? Well, uh, let, let me share what I think is the key there. If we could establish stronger economic and trade ties between the United States and Cuba, I would hope that could lead to greater freedom for the Cuban people. If you can get to that stage, then we can normalize. I don't think you can just start out by saying we're going to normalize without some sort of opportunity for freedom uh, for those Cubans. And we were down there and we experienced it, and uh, you've heard me tell the story. Uh, after we had cut the deal, 
uh, Castro invited us over, and we went into his conference room at 8.45 at night, and he started uh, giving us a lecture about Cuba. We were behind our chairs thinking he was going to offer us a, a seat at some point. It's 9.45. We're still standing. 10.45, 11.45, 12.45, four hours later before he uh, quit talking, and then I had to rebut that. And I thought to myself, you know what, I should give him a four-hour lecture about Nebraska. But we had a plane to catch at 7 o'clock, so I <laughs> held it to five minutes and said he ought to sign an exclusive agreement with the state of Nebraska. And instead of a, a $17 million trade deal, we could get a $30 million trade deal. Well, the next day I get back to Omaha. I'm in the Papillion La Vista area doing a reception at 6.30 at night. Pedro Alvarez, his chief uh, export in Porter uh, person called me up and said, hey, we love you so much there in Nebraska. Uh, Castro's agreed to a $30 million deal. So it did pay to negotiate with him. What do you do along those same lines to market Nebraska to Nebraskans to get the best minds, the best talent to stay here in our state? Well, first of all, you got to learn and make sure you understand Nebraska and what we have to offer. We've got great leaders in the business community, the ag community, uh, in general, all across the state. And so whenever we were on an international trade mission, we would take those experts with us. When we went to China, Brandy, we had 65 Nebraskans go with us. And so we could talk about irrigation equipment. We're the leader in in the world in that regard. We had ag leaders. We had Omaha business leaders talking about intellectual property. Uh, Union Pacific, Warner Transportation, they're talking about transportation issues. So I just took the experts with me, and I'm just the guy who stands up and introduces all these great guys who can help you lead a better life, and we've been very successful at that. One of the things you have to do, though, is you have to also convince people to stay here, as Brandy referenced. I mean, you know, how, do you, how do you fight that brain drain? How do you, I mean, it's tough to keep college students who look to the coast, who look to the mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, we always have to fight that. Here's what we've done, Rob. We've been successful. We've been able to reverse quite a bit of that. Uh, you, you've got to focus on greater job opportunities for young people and middle class families. That's why I've talked about you need a better tax structure so you can be more job competitive in that global marketplace. And today we have greater opportunities in agriculture, value added agriculture. And then look at the Omaha area and, and the Lincoln area. We're a leader in insurance, manufacturing, technology, transportation, health care, education. And uh, we offer more diversity of opportunity for young people than in any time in the history of this state. And I just try to connect higher education with the business community. One of the things we did, we started an intern program so that we pay for half of it if you allow a new internship with young kids at any of our colleges in your particular business. Interesting. Well, we're going to take another short break, but still ahead, obviously, our conversation's continuing. That's right. We're going to go to several hot-button issues, very quick answers. You don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Well, welcome back. We're, we're talking here with the Governor Heineman in a special one-hour edition of KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Obviously, yeah. we could talk all day long, Absolutely. but we're going to call this the lightning round. The big issues, we're going to throw out the question and hopefully get an answer and then we move on. Governor, we talked about before same-sex marriage, your stance here in Nebraska. We just talked about not wanting people to leave the state. How do we find a middle ground between those two? Uh, Brandy, that's a difficult one. It's a states' rights issue where uh, marriage has always been the, the prerogative of individual states. And here's the challenge on that one. It wasn't the legislature who passed that bill. Nebraskans voted on it. 70% of our citizens said we want marriage between, be, to be between a man and a woman. You've got to respect the right uh, uh, of the voters of this state. Affordable Care Act, is it going to get repealed? Uh, I don't know that's going to get repealed. If it were to get repealed, it needs to be replaced. But I think the Supreme Court is going to strike a blow to it uh, this June when they say that if you don't have a state exchange, you're not entitled to federal benefits. That will cause uh, a, a bit of a collapse in, the, in Obamacare and I think force everybody to the table and let's get it done right and proper this time. Immigrant children who came to the United States illegally, have we any update on are they here? Will they go back? Uh, we don't have any update on it. This is why we need comprehensive uh, immigration form at the federal level. Secure our border, use greater technology to get to legal immigration faster, and then you're just going to have to decide those that are here illegally, how are you going to handle them? As we try to tell the federal government all the time, we make tough decisions as governor. Make one. You're going to make half of America, man, no matter what you do, but make a decision. The DREAM Act, talking about immigration, the bill to provide a permanent residency to certain immigrants who qualify, 
support or oppose? You know, uh, we've always generally opposed to that. I, I wish they'd maybe go one step further and say, if you uh, are an illegal individual, uh, a, a, a kid in particular, mm -hmm. if you went uh, through high school, learned English, and then maybe you served in public service, a uh, military or otherwise for two years, then you could get uh, your citizenship, citizenship. I think that'd be a better way. The learning communities come under fire recently in the Omaha area. You and Sally very passionate about education. Where do you stand on that? You know, uh, I signed it into law. We hoped it was going to work. I don't think it has. I think it's time to get rid of the extra bureaucracy and, and, and get back to our original focus on helping kids with academic achievement, academic improvement. I just don't think it's worked as well as everybody intended. The Castle Doctrine, defending your own property, support or oppose? Support it. And what would you? Some people may say that's too much. It's a little dangerous to have people out there, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. Well, I, I think you have to write the law very carefully, but you have a right to defend yourselves. Call self-defense, defend your property. I think most Nebraskans support that. Anything in particular you'd like to see Governor Elect Ricketts focus on? You know, I hope they continue our focus on uh, education, and the economy, and jobs. That's the key. That's what Nebraskans care about. When I talk to them every day, they want to give their kids the very best education they, that we can give them, both in public and private schools, higher education. And then they want to know they can get jobs here in Nebraska because they, when, when they get married, those parents and grandparents want to be close to their grandkids. And uh, this is a great place to raise a, a family, to work. Uh, and so again, job creation, education, those are the two key issues. A lot of people order things on the internet. Uh, would you support uh, increasing the enforcement of collecting the sales tax? Because a lot of people order things on the internet and not pay the sales tax. Uh, what we really need to do, Rob, the federal government's got to decide this issue, how they're going to handle it, and they shied away from doing it. It's becoming a more difficult issue all the time because more and more people are going to the internet to purchase, and yet they say, hey, look, I don't want to pay the taxes if I don't have to. I don't blame them for that. So this is one where we need the federal government to decide what the policy is going to be. We'll be right back with some final thoughts. First, though, a reminder, your comments are an important part of this show. If you want to be heard, two ways you can do it. You can call us directly at 402-978-8960. Please speak clearly. We may use your comments on the air. And if you can, try to be brief. Email, you can go to KATV.com, click on the Chronicle link. Tell us what you think about Governor Heinemann's 10 years in office and how he ran the state of Nebraska. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the special edition of KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Today we've talked with Governor Dave Heineman about prison reform, taxes, good times, and bad times. We have just a few minutes left, so, Governor, where do you go now? We know Fremont, but career wise, what are you going to do? You know, I, we really don't know the answer to that. This job is uh, 24 7, 365, year round. So, January 7th is the last day. We'll move back to Fremont on January 8th and start to reflect on what's the next chapter. I know I'm going to stay active here in Nebraska. I want to continue to contribute. So will Sally, and I just don't know what it will be just yet. My dad always said, just do the job you have really well, and the rest will take care of itself. And that's the way I've operated. You have said January 7th, the state is on your shoulders. January 8th, it's on Pete Ricketts' shoulders. What advice have you given him? You know, I, I, I've tried to share with him uh, all the challenges you face in state government, but I've also tried to tell him, listen to the people in Nebraska, do your research. Trust your instincts and be yourself. Don't try to be like any other governor. I didn't try to do that. I just tried to be who I was, and I think that's the best way to act. You're looking back on your 10 years in office, and, and longer than that, uh, what are you going to miss the most? I think I'm going to miss the people in Nebraska. They're a great uh, group of people to work for, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to represent them. I love the interaction uh, with them. They share their ideas with me. They share their strong opinions, but they expect us to work together. So that's what I'm going to miss. What are you going to miss the least? You know, I've enjoyed every part of being a uh, governor, from the tough policy decisions to uh, out uh, honoring people, uh, whether business person of the year, teacher of the year, kids who receive academic and athletic awards. So uh, every part, I love every part of this job. And are you going to miss it all the... The, I have not missed. Are you going to? Are you going to welcome the privacy of being a, a private citizen again? I, I think we're going to enjoy that. We can be a little more spontaneous. Uh, you know, uh, we kid all the time. When you're governor, you don't drive. So I haven't driven in 10 years. I've got to go back to driver's education class. Probably learn how to drive all over again. And my wife and son, uh, they want to know when I'm out on the road because they're going to be at home. And uh, anything keep you up at night? If you if you had a do-over 
If you had a mulligan, I know you're a golfer. If you had a mulligan, what would you take it on? Not really. I'd like more to actually, but I understand how the system works. You keep working on it every single year. We've made a lot of progress. We passed the two largest tax relief packages in the history of the state. I'd like to do more, but the next governor and the next legislature can improve us even more. All right. If you get that phone call saying, "Will you run for Senate? Will you run for Congress?" Would you do it? No. Uh, I, I love uh, being the governor. It's the best job in this state. Uh, I love being the governor of the best state in the United States of America, and it's been a high honor and privilege to serve the people of Nebraska, but I don't want to be a senator or a congressperson. Just a few seconds left, like 10, 15 seconds. What's your final message to Nebraska? Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you for all you've done for uh, our family. Uh, we're enormously proud of our citizens and this state. Well, we want to thank you, Governor Heineman, for being here with us today. And, of course, thank all of you for tuning in today. Yeah, and remember, if you missed any part of this show, you can watch it right now online at KETV.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.